Here's the guru, Giono, and he joins us again on a Wednesday night to uh, take us through the top 10 picks. <laughs> He's uh, just about ready to go officially with this. We're going to get the inside early in the piece. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cal, welcome to you. G'day, Jared. G'day, Jono. Yeah, hey, Cal. It, it's getting closer. I'm not ready to exactly not quite pull the trigger. And what hit... date? What date are you going to pull the trigger? So, so the draft on the 28th. Opening night is the 28th, yes. second night the 29th. The, the trigger will be pulled on the 26th. <laughs> okay. Can but, you give us the time? Because the, I, you should, I think you should lay it on the line. This We could build this up it's actually, over the next couple of weeks and your time, you watch the amount of people watching. F- forget the state election, which is the same day. <laughs> this is going to be drawing in the clicks on <laughs> AFL.com. Oh, hang on. You. So you're outrating Dan Andrews, according to yourself, <laughs> <laughs> or whoever wins the election. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk just if I can about if we go back and, and you've uh, been in this business for a fair period of time now. I, I look at the end of the year and I see some names that were high draft picks and they've been cut. Mm. And we, we and each time I look at that and I think, well, we're going to go into this next couple of weeks and everybody's excited and you know, a top ten pick doesn't guarantee you too much. I mean, it guarantees you that you've got ability and it guarantees you you get probably four years minimum, yeah, probably six. But it's no guarantee that you can build a career out of it. I was going to say, the guarantee is opportunity yep. at the start. And then, as you say, a, a contract or two, and probably a pretty good contract to start. Yep. And then maybe another one after that. But beyond that, I think we're seeing more movement at the, the top end as well of these early picks. Like you look back at the 2016 draft, and I think only three of the top 10, six years on, are still at their clubs. And we saw Jack Bowes this year yep. be one of those who moved from that year. Griffin Logue was another one. The year before was um, uh, Will Brody from Gold Coast to Fremantle. So, as you say, wherever you go to start with, we're seeing fr- – uh, personally, I think the players are seeing that from um, – uh, as they enter the system as draftees, are seeing younger players make their moves and change mm. the clubs and thinking, well, if I don't like where I am within a year or two, I can get out. I can move. Now, is that a, a healthy thing for the competition? That's debatable. Is it a reality? I think it is. Is it uh- – Fixable? Can we move them to four-year contracts? I don't think the uh, players will want to do that. It's been no, they probably don't want to do it, but no. it's a question is, can the AFL do it? Because it- Well, the AFL can't do anything like around contracts without the Players Association mm. agreeing to, and I think that would mm. be a stumbling block for that. Then- who, who initially brought that in back? I'm trying to think back in the, no, Scott- the day. Was it an AFL call that, that we're on a set two-year deal to start, or was that a players' association call back in the day? Been part of that agreement for a long time, hasn't it? And, yeah. And obviously, the rookies get a one-year deal to start with, and, and, that, and-, and that's a good point you make because it, it has been around for a long time, and and the the landscape's changed. It's changed from when I was drafted and got a got a two-year deal, yeah. To, and that was a long time ago, and it through the early two thousands it started to shift again. Now it's in we're in a different, different, completely different landscape. So maybe we need to look at it. I think the expansion sides over the, the, the time as well. I remember Scott Clayton when he was list manager at, at Gold Coast raising this with the AFL, saying, look, we're having trouble keeping some of these guys. Three, mm. An extra year, an extra 12 months might be enough to make them settle in that, that little bit more. Especially with Tassie coming in too into, into the future. So that, that might be the time where some of these decisions are, are made around the length of of a draftee, especially a maybe a first round draftee as well. And clubs are going through this CBA negotiations as well with the yep. players in AFL at the moment. I'm just trying to remember the name of the uh, young guy who sparked this, I guess, thought process in my mind. He he was recruited to the West Coast Eagles. He's a tall centre half forward. He was a pick five or six. Oscar Allen went pick eight. He ended up in the Giants last year, and then he got delisted from the Giants. Jared Brander. Jared Brander's the man. So. He's now gone from the competition unless he gets a, somehow a third club. And yet yep. when he was picked, it was – I mean, a few clubs had dropped off him, but he was picked and he was regarded as, you know, a, a player that you build a premiership around. Yeah, he, he was their first pick. As you say, he went before Oscar, Oscar Allen. Allen. And yeah. everyone said, how did Oscar Allen get to there? You know, but well, West Coast took someone, a Victorian, or you know, he was part of that Giants Academy as well. Mm. And he was part of that – I guess a furor. Do they get access to this Riverina zone? And yep. and in the end, they didn't get priority access to him. He ended up there down the line, ironically. But I think you're right, Jared. And that's where clubs as well look at the tools in the draft. And he was a tall, clearly. And the hit rate of the tools at the top end is, is lower than the hit rate of the midfielders. And, and that's just the reality too, because the midfielders generally dominate their draft years and, and the tools sometimes don't. And even... Look, Josh Shackey was one of the exceptions who did dominate his mm. draft year. He kicked 60 goals in his draft year for Vic Country in the Murray Bush Rangers. He needed to be drafted now. 
because the 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 game didn't the AFL game didn't suit Josh Shackey. The NAB the, League the full the, forward it did in the NAB League, mm. but what the full forward had to do when he entered the competition is different to what the full forward currently has to do today, yeah. which is a a shame, and you hope he can capture that. But his momentum's gone, unfortunately, and yeah. it's going to take a fair bit for him to get it back. Third club now. That's uh, right. the Demons and, and gets an opportunity. We talked uh, then again around the opportunities that early picks get and that lasting impact. Well, he's a third timer now. I think I think that's the, the tall factor as well. Mm. If you've got some height, you seem to get uh, more opportunities than if you're, combo. if you're under six foot. <laughs> we had George Wardlaw in the studio yesterday afternoon, and it was, it was a brilliant chat. He's a young man on, on the rise. He didn't give too much away. I, th- I think he knows in himself that he's going to go early in the draft. Do you know specifically where he will go? He's an Essendon fan growing up. I think deep down he'd love that, but I'm not sure whether he gets there. The Essendon fan uh, loves Michael Hurley and big Oasis fan as well. So he's got a, a part of my heart there, George. But he, I think he'd, I'd be very surprised if he wasn't at North Melbourne okay. with pick two or three at this point. Look, he... And to be honest, if he'd played the full year, George, um, he's pretty humble listening last night. He, he speaks well, George. He's pretty humble about how his footy goes. But if he'd played the full year, I really think that he would have been as talked about and as discussed as what Will Ashcroft has been for the number one. Okay. They're different. They're yep. different players. And we're seeing probably the Sam Walsh in, in Will Ashcroft, and we're probably seeing the Clayton Oliver in, in George Wardlaw. It's just that three hamstring injuries back to back to back almost. And and a couple weren't as serious. Yeah. You know, um, particularly the last one, but those obviously stopped his momentum. I've got to say, like he wanted to get to Essendon, but Essendon Talk Hobbs is about the same size last year. Yep. They've got uh, a, a smallish midfield. I wouldn't have thought he'd get there. I don't think, you know, I think that they're chasing something with a bit of height, just to, from a balance perspective. There's there's needs and talent when you've got pick four. That's that's the, the question, yeah. isn't it? And such a good pick. They, they're going to have five top 13 picks over the course of three years. So that, that's the talent build to, to sort of grow from. Yeah, Hobbs uh, last year, Darcy Parrish, all Australian, but 181, yep. 182. Zach Merritt's about the same size. He's a star, but that size. Annie McGrath, who I personally think should be playing up half back this year, mm. but, but even shorter. Jai Caldwell's about the same size. So, But I think if Wardlaw was there, the, the talent part of him, and he's different. He actually goes in the air. He takes marks okay. and he kicks goals. And he'd be comfortable starting off a half forward line. Mm. And he's more aggressive, I think, physically than some of those other guys. But um, I don't think he's getting there for one. And two, there are some taller midfielders who might be available. Okay. Well, you can tell us who those are uh, shortly. But uh, Brett wants to know, whilst we're on the Kangaroos, um, can you ask, Kel, is Cooper Harvey going to end up son of Boomer? Yeah. He's ending up at North Melbourne for sure. That's a lock. So they've done some some pick swapping over the past couple of days to ensure that they can use their, their last live pick at the national draft on Cooper Harvey. And again, another player who's suffered some injuries this year, a couple of arm injuries that, that ruled him out for significant chunks of this season. So we probably didn't see the best of him. I know you know Boomer well, yep. Jono, um, through different things over the years and, and the AFL Academy too. And he... Um, he's a different player to Brent, but he's a powerful midfield forward option and late in the year did show a bit of his excitement. I don't think they're going to get 444 games <laughs> out of him. Well, they got half. He, he'd be going well. I'd be going really well. So whilst we're on uh, <laughs> midfielders, who are Geelong going to take with their first pick, which I assume is pick seven? It's pick seven, yeah. they got a, they got a Joel Selwood look a lot, not look a lot, but play alike, haven't they? Jai Clark, if he gets there. All right. So there's a bit of interest in him before pick seven as well. Uh, I think he'd be in the mix for Gold Coast and, and also the Hawks. So there's a, a bit of a wait there for what the Cats do at pick seven and, and what they need. And the other midfielders who could be around there, Cam McKenzie's another player who's um, different to Jai. Jai's about 181 and 182 um, size mid, but tough and competitive and a leader. And he's got the, the sort of steely edge to him. And Cam McKenzie's 188 centimetres. He'd be around there. Um, Mateus Philip, who is another one who could be. Where's Mateus going? Could he go to the Bombers? He could. He could. He's definitely in that mix, I think. And um, his dad was a good player. I played a little bit of footy with him in about '95, '96, around yeah, that sort of time. Three or four but he was a gun one, in yeah. gun in the sample. Yeah. Um, Mateus is a, a different type of player. 191 centimeters. Mm. Um, played midfield forward. Lots of confidence about himself, and and that's part of him his mentality as well and that's part of what clubs are digging into um, just how good he can be he's young he's born on december 27 or something like that so he's five years off being in next year's draft so that's five where, days you mean sorry five, five days five days yeah. being, being off next year's draft which wow. is um, part of the upside you see in some of these guys the numbers one three hundred seven three six seven three six. give us a call like Lindsay has done down in summer welcome to you Lindsay. 
Thanks, Jared. Uh, good evening, guys. Um, interesting chat. Um, Jared, I know you're aware of this guy. I'm a Brisbane supporter and a Yarrawonga lover, Eli Smith. Yep. I mean, he was hit pick at 20, I think. Never got a single game, despite some good form, and I'm just a bit stunned they never ever give him a run once. And do you think he'll get picked up? Look, I don't know the answer to that, Lindsay. I, I trained with uh, Eli a couple of years ago when I went up there and trained uh, with him a couple of times in the preseason. And, you know, he, for all intents and purposes, he looked like he was a young guy on the way up, might have needed to shed a couple of kilos, might have needed to get a little bit fitter. But uh, I was I was surprised that ultimately he didn't get a Guernsey. Now, I guess it's it's difficult when you've got a powerful midfield, but does he get picked up? Well, I'll leave that to Kel Termi, but based on what I just saw at training, which is not enough of a sample size to give you an, an informed answer, but he was a high draft pick, and uh, clearly he hasn't lost his talent, but uh, he, he hasn't made his way in, which is, says something. Yeah, it does. And he spent four years there. He was... I think one of the last picked in the first round of the 2018 mm. super draft and, and mm. didn't play obviously beyond that and was a bit of a bolter at that point, fit the, the Brisbane country mold and yeah. that type of competitive type of player. Look, he's a, we spoke about this over the last couple of weeks and, and it's something the clubs talk about a lot too. How many of these inside ball winners you can have on your list yeah. in one midfield. And he's probably been a little bit of a victim of that as clubs trying to work out what they do next. And just on that super draft, Collier Dawkins, um, Stocker, Smith, probably the last three picks of that first round all cut this off season. When you look at the the pick swaps, some have happened yesterday. What are your anticipations leading into the, the national draft? Do you think there'll be a lot more action or do you think things have sort of started to settle on that front? It's funny. They had this pick swaps window that comes straight after the trade period and leads up to now. Now it's like the, the blackout, the pre-election yeah. blackout. It's like that before the, the draft as well. And Clubs are still talking and there's a lot of discussions and it's almost like you have a plan A, B, C, D and if this player is all there or not there, then we'll, we'll execute this one or we'll pull the trigger on that trade. If not, then we'll do something else. I think the the big ones inside the first round are the Giants at pick 19. I think that one, or pick, that's the end of the first round, sorry, um, inside the top 20. That one's up for grabs, I think. There's a chance that they could bundle their picks and move up the order as well. I think the Swans would like to bundle 14 and 17 and move in. But the problem is, for them trying to get in, there's a dozen players or so that have established themselves as the mm. top rung. Mm. No one wants to get out. So you need a buyer and seller. Yeah. Last year, was it last year they had a, they had a pick swap before pick one. Now, have the AFL made a rule on this? Because I, <laughs> I was flat, Jared. We The massive build-up, here we yeah. go, pick one, and well, then there was a pick swap, and we all went, oh, then there really? Was a rule, then there was a rule change. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, well, no, well, no, I think there's going to be one again. Really? As soon as the then game – There's a call on this. I it's think, like playing a first game in, you know, <laughs> as, as a sub. sub. <laughs> you just don't – you don't, can't do that. I, well, last year North was involved in that, and they ended up doing quite well out of it. But that was because the dogs had to – it's all about list spots and how many – I don't want to get too complicated because it's actually very confusing, but list spots yep. taking into the draft, how many spots you can use depends on how many points you can take. So that was last Sam Darcy. And I, un and I understand that. And this year, the the Lions and, and North Melbourne have talked about it and discussed the trade where the Lions will get more points off um, North Melbourne because North don't need this last pick because um, they're going to use their other last pick on Cooper Harvey. Mm. And in the meantime, they'll get a future pick off – Brisbane, but it's going to be done, I think, as the gates open on night one. So, sorry, John, I think there's going to be another <laughs> no, trade they can't there. Do, they can't do it to <laughs> us again. I think I think that needs to be done Just offline. the aesthetics yeah, of it. Of course, it's pick one. Like, we we build up. you got to talk, we, we we talk, talk about, about something for five minutes. Well, I know, but we talk, about, <laughs> we talk about pick one for, you know, for 10 weeks now, mm. and it's a massive build up. Who's top 10? But I understand the highlight is who gets pick one, who gets the, the reward of that, and that should be the highlight first. Then we go into everything else post that. I'll tell you what we will be talking about on, on draft night in terms of pick one, and that's what the weight will be. Are they going to make a bid on Will Ashcroft mm. or not? Whereas last year we, we knew that they were pretty locked in on Jason Horn Francis without making a bid on Darcy or Dacos. I, and look, closer to the draft, we, we we get probably an indication one way or the other, but that's going to be a big talking point in the lead up. Brian's from Bali. He wants to know uh, whether West Coast can bundle up picks eight and 12 to get pick two. And go back. Well, they had picked two, and then they went back to mm. eight and 12. I don't think they're going to go back that way. Um, no, I think they're most likely to stay where they are. It'd be surprising to, to, to move back up the order. And they've got four inside 26. It's a pretty good draft haul for them, I think. So who are they earmarking if uh, they've split their picks? They had a good deal. I don't think they moved back with anyone specifically in mind. I think if Ruben Jimby can be there, that he'd be a, a really good pick yep. for them. He's the local um, 
one eighty nine centimeter mid half back. He'd be different to what they've got. I, I, and there's a chance now. I think he gets through to to pick eight. That that's not beyond the realms at all. And pick twelve. Well, Elijah Hewitt could be there. Also, um, Ed Allen, who's obviously the son of Ben, and he's right in that mix. He's been a bit of a bolter to push up inside the, the top dozen or so selections. Jed Bustling is a local key back as well. So all of those guys and Mateus, who I think is the wild card of the the top dozen, because I, I feel like Essen and Hawthorne, West Coast, Geelong, St Kilda, all these clubs Crows. could look at him. Oh, they can trade their future first to get back in. Again, what I spoke about. I, Knowing next year's pool and and Adelaide still being on the build, I think it would be unlikely for them to, to move out of next year's pool because it's really exciting. There you go, Josh. Doesn't sound like uh, he's going to end up at the Crows. Uh, jo- Jake is from Stone Mountain. Welcome to the program, Jake. Oh, g'day, g'day gentlemen. Um, just a couple of things. Um, so with uh, the Magpies' first pick, you think they're going to – I know they've gone and got Billy Frampton and a couple of other boys, some tall lads and Charlie Dean. And they, do you think they're still going to be chasing a key defender or is it going to be going forward? I know they've got um, the big fella McStay. What, what, what's your opinion? What do you think, draft specialists? <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of key backs who would be in that mix. Jed Buslinger, if he got there, would be a good pick. Uh, Lewis Hayes, who's the younger brother of Sam at Port Adelaide. He's 200 centimetres. He could be around there. And Josh Weddle's the other the key position defender. Had about 192 centimetres, Jared, but he, he runs the, the two-kilometre time trial in six minutes and three seconds, which we love. And then he does the 20-metre the sprint in under three seconds. All so the combo. I love, love the combo. It's all about the combo. Yes. Hell, of a, hell of a runner. <laughs> I can see him playing, but probably gonna doesn't impact this year. When I when I see the two recruits, Billy Frampton, centre half forward, they tried him at centre half back, and uh, you got McGrath, centre half forward, started centre half back. I can still see him playing off the half back line next day. I should say not mm. McGrath next day playing off the half back line, and he's such a beautiful kick as a as a deliverer, as a somebody who distributes. Now, I'm sure he's lined up for them. They've got in his, their mind probably forward, but I can still see at some stage him playing back. I think they've brought him in to be a, a, a swingman. A swingman, yeah. yeah. I, I think that that's the capacity for him. And I feel like his marking, as you say, gives him strength at both ends, and, and they probably need that back up at both ends too. Well, it's become one of the most important positions on the on the ground now, that ability. And I know the, the, the Bulldog, and I've said it at times with Aaron Norton potentially going and playing that role, just because if you've got someone there – that area like the Sydney Swans had the McCartan boys, it makes it difficult for the opposition to, to break through. But then your own team know that, you know, nine times out of 10, we're actually going to be in this contest and they start to spread a little bit earlier mm. from a, from a midfield point of view for the, for the outlet. So that position is, is super critical. Could McStay do it? Possibly. Well, I've seen him do it at the, uh, at mm. Marvel stadium, John, when yep. he was, uh, his early years, he played a fair few games at center half back. And I, I always saw himself... consistency now in his performance, yeah. I think, which has been, you know, up and down a little bit. Uh, moving on, afternoon, I have a question for Kel. Will Lewis Hayes go in the top 20 of this year's draft? Thanks, Darren. I'd like to know that for sure as well, but he's going to be right in that mix. Uh, Tell us about him. He's 199 key back, marks well. Um, start, big back, 199. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the thing about it, him. Like, he's going to be able to play, if he gets going as an AFL player, on Max King and, and these mm. taller types. And the best key forwards now are that, are that size. Yeah, so, they're 200 plus, aren't they? And he goes for his marks. He's actually quite an attacking defender, so it's probably not as much playing on the def- the key forwards that he's done this year as go for his grabs and be a bit of an offensive option for them. So, um, yeah, I think he's going to be right in that top 20 grasp. I was trying to make the case with Jono last night, just just to throw it up on the whiteboard for a, a bit of a uh, spin around. Where does King play? Could King possibly play next year in the back half for the Suns? Mm-hmm. Oh, for the Suns, Ben King? It's a good question. Well, he, his junior career was as, as a was. defender. They've got um, two guys they've got out of the draft. I think the day Max um, went down with his knee reconstruction or anterior cruciate ligament strain, um, Ben went forward and kicked nine. Mm. So, but And that was probably the start of where he thought, okay, I'll, I'll be the, the forward. But that's pre Marbio Chole and um, Levi Caswell. Mm. Yeah, he's, he's certainly capable. Certainly I think capable. He's, I, 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 I still, don't mind it. I, at times, possibly. Would it Jared, ease him but, back in? Uh, the Chole the Chol King combination is what Stuart Jew wants. Surely that that's the excitement. That's what's that's what's filling the stadium at Metricon if those two get going. I reckon wins fills the stadium, and if you've got Levi Casbolt and Marvio, you know that's working. But that creates the wins, those two. That combination creates the W. What about the 
I mean, he's he's to me a piece that could it just elevates their class across that half back line. Would you throw a Levi Casbolt to that position no. because of his marking ability, I, I which we just spoke about distribution with distribution? Yeah, but doesn't others work. others can feed off that as well. Okay. Anyway, it's just something to throw up on the <laughs> whiteboard, Jono. It is well, because it goes to that role again, which has become critical in your structure as a as a footy club. You've got to have you've got to have that. All the key teams have a have a key back that's unbelievable in the air and wins it back. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the Kangaroos uh, is Sheasel going to the Kangaroos, or are they going to uh, double up uh, with Wardlaw and his mate Sarsis? Sardis, yeah, Sardis. Those two are pretty tight. I th- I think Sheasel is the favourite at this point. Yeah, and kick 49 goals this year across all levels. He's a class. Jeez, that's good. <laughs> yeah, she whiz. <laughs> yeah, that's, he, he's, that's he, bad by you and I, Cal. <laughs> too early for that. He's, he's, he's something a bit different for them, and, and they don't have a player like him. He's got that Stevie J um, tendency around goal. Mm. He just creates something out of nothing, um, great above his – above his head as well for a player his size and, and converts. When he got an opportunity, Harry doesn't miss too many. So uh, I can see why he's got some fans there. So what about Henry Husswaite? Uh, can he get to the pies, Kel? He can. I think he'd be more a chance at their second and third pick than, than the first one. I think that's his draft range, probably 20 to 30, 195 centimetre midfield. He's had a bit of a growth spurt, so um, still a bit gangly, but yep. um, a good user of the footy. Jono doesn't think the pies are going to make the eight. No. <laughs> well, you've got them sixth or seventh, so you've got them seventh or eighth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Given that they've picked up Tom Mitchell and a couple of tools, do you see them missing the eight? No, I think, John, are you crazy there, mate? No, I'm not, cra- I'm not crazy. I've got... Some, somebody is going to miss the eight. It's hard, the well, this is the thing. We've, we've, we've been through it, Cal, the last three nights. and There's 15 in the eight. Well, yeah. there, there could yeah. be. Once, but that's what we we're talking about. The, the competition is so good at the moment that up to 14 teams can play finals next year. And we even talked about potentially either Essendon or the West Coast Eagles off a bottom six draw. Bouncing, especially West Coast. If they get their game together with their senior players, they could win eight at home and all of a sudden they're bouncing. Yeah. So... There's there's a lot to play out here, and it's it's tough to put fit them all in, Jared. Oh, and, and and the luck went Collingwood's way, didn't it? I know you have to be in the it, right spot, and it could go their way again. Yep, but it's a tougher draw now. That's all I'm. That's all I'm resting on. And I and I said it's not a bad thing for Collingwood. But if they're they a better went, side too now. Yeah, but if they went from there and and got to seventh or eighth, I think that's still a progression as a football club because they've played tougher teams consistently throughout next year, which will make them better again to really explode in 2024. I'll just go back to that uh, final they played against Geelong. They looked a better side than... Uh, than the side. Cats? Well, they looked like they... Yeah, they did. They looked like they had the Cats measure. It was incredible. That was that was the quarter, that last quarter yeah, that won them right. the flag. But the seasons have stopped. Momentum stopped. Yes, yep. So, therefore, can they capture it consistently against the best? And, and I'll be watching like everybody else. And I hope, deep down, I hope they do because I love watching them this year. But it's going to be tougher. I'm really excited to see the influence of Tom Mitchell on Nick Dacos in the handball back you know, option and, and how good that can be for Nick. I, we've, we've barely seen a, a first year as good as that. Mm. I don't know what sort of midfield split he's going to have next year. I'm sure he'll be looking for an extra bit of midfield time uh, than, than halfback than he had this year. But he was so good there as it was. Now you've got one of the best inside distributors who knows what his role is within that group. So... Mm. I think that'd be really interesting. Certainly frees Pendlebury up, who, for a, what is he, 34 years of age, second in the best and fairest, I think it yeah. was. Mm-hmm. Another incredible year. Doesn't look like slowing down. Plus, at, the, at the, opposition, the opposition watch on Collingwood goes to a whole new level in terms of their scouting of how to how to stop what was created yep. this year. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike's from Geelong. He's joined us on the line. Welcome to you, Mike. Oh, thank you very much, guys. Um, yeah, I just had a quick uh, query on Jerome Lawrence. Uh, Stephen Lawrence's son, um, whether he's a chance of getting picked up by the Hawks or whether he'll go a late or even a rookie draft. Uh, there was a bit of talk about him earlier in the year. Yeah, there was, and, and we saw a bit of him earlier in the year. Probably not as much towards the end of the season. He's a key position, as you say, forward. Um, Stephen Lawrence, premiership player at uh, the Hawks, 91, I think. Um, so mm. uh, they've got eligibility there. I think more likely to be sort of a late slash rookie option um, for clubs, though. How does it go with some of these youngsters? And we sport, and we, I know we've spoken about um, George Wardlaw already, but only played like six games yeah. this this year. But he's so highly touted. Yeah, you've got others that have played all year, but we pick the faults. Yeah, it's funny. It's 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 like sometimes you can be overexposed. Mm. Um, I'm not saying that with George, but there has been stories of, of players who've um, dominated their under 17s year, um, 
And then they play with really well at the start of the year. And, and by the middle of the year, clubs are starting to look at what they can't do as well as the things they can. Whereas mm. the late entry, maybe the player who comes mm. in off the back of the championships or shows a little bit there and then gets better, all of a sudden the better bits are the highlights. So mm. that's what clubs, and I think recruiters are the hardest working people in the industry, to be honest. They, they do that many unseen hours um, beyond the stuff that we do see on the weekends and put together at all. But I think that can happen sometimes. Seem to be very much the Chris Scott model was focus on what they can do, not what they can't do. Mm. And uh, I think they were doing that uh, with a couple of young blokes that they had in the side and uh, they knew they were going to make some mistakes and uh, they just kept on backing them in. And by the end of the year, they had a flag. And Geelong are recruiting like that as well and have always recruited about the positives, haven't they? And and backing the, the, the slices. And Kevin Sheen always talks about the slices that you say. that the, the, They can be thin. They can be bigger wedges. They can be the whole pizza. But the, sometimes <laughs> just one slice of the margarita can be enough to say, okay, that's that's the play that's got enough for you. Cooper Vickery? Yeah, he's a player from uh, the Gippsland Power region who's tied to Hawthorne via the Next Generation Academy. So they get priority access to him after pick 40. Before pick 40, he's up for grabs to anyone. Mm -hmm. I think he'll get through to the 40s and they'll be able to select him there. And I, I think he'd be a, a good addition to them. Bit of a, a runner uh, through the midfield. Paul wants to know when the fixture's coming out, Kel. Yeah, I think that'd be post-draft. So it's a big couple of weeks for the AFL. So they've obviously got um, the AFLW finals, finals, preliminary finals this weekend, then the grand final the following weekend, and then the draft after that. I think we'll wait until uh, after the national draft for, before that's all are you hearing? Are you hearing how round one will play out, Kel? I think it's most likely to start on the Thursday night. Okay, uh, Richmond and Carlton. That's the the overwhelming favourite to go back to that, and without the uh, the grand final rematch, each and, other. and then obviously the extra round adds in to probably see the final go through to or the grand final be through to Saturday the thirtieth September, so they they get it in just before the October cut. So Jono is going to uh, give us his previews after seven o'clock, but seeing as you're here, yes, this is what uh, we ended up with. Well, Jono ended up with <laughs> Geelong, Brisbane. Melbourne, Sydney, Richmond, Western Bulldogs. So it's top six, middle six, or bottom six. So you've got Geelong, Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, Richmond, Western Bulldogs. That's top six. Yep. Then outside of that, you've got Carlton, Fremantle, and Collingwood, who John o had in the middle six. You can read out the rest of the middle six as well, if you like. I might well, like a couple well, others in there. I haven't quite. Oh, Port Adelaide's there. Yeah, Port Adelaide's um, in there. Gold, was there. And Gold Coast are in there. And Gold Coast. Yep. So... Th Ultimately, what we're saying is, if Jono's got three sides, Carlton, Fremantle and Collingwood, who I think a lot of judges will have in the six, yep. and some will have them out of the six, it just goes to show what we probably know anyway. <laughs> That's just, there's going to be injury, there's going to be you know all manner of issues that make it such a tight season. And I like Port Adelaide, to be honest. Yeah. I, I think that if they can get everyone on the park, um, they've got the excitement there. They still play for Kenny Hinckley. Um, he's still got... Only a couple of years ago, it was you know back-to-back -back prelim finals and the most wins across those two seasons combined. So I think uh, the additions of Jason Horn francis um, Junior Rioli, they get Orazio Fantasia back, you know, fingers crossed for him that he can get out there and play. There's some some stuff to work with there. Especially their bigs. We speak about their bigs and Charlie Dixon's probably mm. the, the main one there. Yeah, yeah, he, is, uh, he needs to get his body right and get those ankles right. Mm. Cal, if Joy Clark goes before the catch pick seven, will Geelong actually end up with a higher rated player than Clark? Uh, is the question from Adam down at the Cattery. <laughs> Adam Selwood? It? <laughs> could be, it could be uh, Andrew Mackey in disguise. <laughs> will they end up with a higher rated player than Joy Clark? I don't well, know what that means, a higher rated player. No, no. I mean, there's, it's a pretty even group around there. Yep. Mm. Matthias Philippou, Cam McKenzie, um, those guys are, are right around that group. And I think for everyone. Bailey Humphrey's another one as a medium forward who will be in that conversation. Ruben Jimby, Ed Allen as well um, is another one who's come from the clouds a little bit. So high rated. It's again, the, the, the exposure V non-exposure argument like Ed Allen as a potential top 10 or so selection only pet played the last six or seven mm. weeks of the season. So compared to Jai Clark, who we've seen across a couple of years. Who's the Wangaratta bolter? <laughs> I saw a headline today that you you were talking about the yeah. Wangaratta Bolter. Boy called Joe Richards, twenty uh, two year old, played country footy this year. Okay, uh, twenty two. Yeah, been on the radar of clubs um, at different points, but uh, this year has really come on, and I think he's going to be picked inside the first 
30 or so selections. What are your, what are your words? Are you, yeah, what, what are you hearing, I should say, from a VFL point of view or a sample? The more mature type player in, in, in this draft, is it – is it go, we're going to see the same sort of mix again? I or I don't think there's going to be as many because the, the mid-season draft has probably ripped them out a, a fair bit over mm -hmm. the last couple yep. of years. But there is a couple who, who've done well. Um, Ethan Phillips is a, a defender who won the, the rising star in that the VFL competition. Uh, and we know how that's sort of been a breeding ground. Everyone of mm. the last 15 or so gets drafted or something like that. So he's one who's been on the radar of clubs. And also Lockie Sullivan played with Footscray in the VFL Um they're another club who like to bring through um, their Footscray graduates mm. over time. And, and whether that's it's the dogs for him or other clubs, I think he's one that clubs are having to look at. Prelim finals coming up this week for the AFLW, Melbourne and North Melbourne. Looks like a real scheduling issue if Brisbane beat uh, Adelaide. But uh, you guys are experts in the AFLW. What's your thoughts? First game, Melbourne v North. Uh I think Melbourne v North. I'm I'm probably tipping Melbourne at this point. I think they've I'm been the same a, as you, Cal. A juggernaut for a couple of years now, and if in the other one, I, I think that uh, Brisbane are looking pretty strong too. So if Brisbane win it. Where do they end up playing it? <laughs> that is, <laughs> that is the big question. Because uh, they're not at the Gabba, and it doesn't look if they're going to stay. They can't in. play at Metricon either. Well, the, the, the problem we've got is if we stay in this uh, month, this this time slot, they're never going to play at the Gabba because cricket's always going to be. No, here. so the options are. Springfield potentially they could go further. You north. can't go to Cairns. Why would you no, travel? No, you. But I'm just saying, if they want to keep it in the game in Queensland, that may become a realist, realistic option. You still for got them. a two-hour flight though. Haven't you? Yeah, I understand that, Jared. But if we're talking about, you know, going to Springfield or going to going to Kazali, yeah, for, from icon, a stadium point of view, if it, if they're not able to do that, the Icon Park and Marvel has been and brought Marvel up again. As well, of course, with Justin Bieber's cancelled concert. Okay, I had a ticket. I had a ticket. <laughs> oh, did I did have a ticket. 